you will get your hair done. Your auntie, who's not your auntie, works from the hive of her high rise, seven stories up in the air. The lifts round here are always broken, so you climb one step, two step, leap to avoid a puddle of piss, four step, five step, six step, maneuver around the boys who have colonized the stairwell, eight step, nine step, land on the tenth. Twist your body and do the same steps all over again. Now you are on the fourth floor, first floor. Repeat six times. Arrive at a black gate, rusted but strong. Ball your fist and knock through the gap you find between two wrought strips of iron. Wait for the door to swing open away from your body. Wait for the gate to swing open into your face. Look at the child who has opened both door and gate. Step inside. Time passes. You are sitting cross-legged on a frayed pattern cushion, bum sore, legs cramped, mind resigned. Your back is a solid mass between against the warmth of her crotch. You and this auntie have become so close you are now the same person, perhaps. Both machine and its end product. Your neck rests taut between her knees, your head periodically pulled from side to side as she braids each weft of hair. This auntie, who is not your auntie, is making magic from and through and with your hair. For hours upon hours, you stay here, in this spot. Nothing to focus on beyond the volume of her voice, the hum of her music, and the yelps her two, or is that three, or is that four kids make as they play behind the back of the front door. Loud mothers breed loud daughters, loud mothers breed loud sons. Products of our parenting. You sit, get your hair braided, and watch the similarities across generations and wonder, is it this obvious when people see you and your own mother, or your cousins and their kids, or the girls from church and their children? Round here, maternity feels mandatory sometimes, despite old stigma of young bellies weighed down by new life. These ends where babies seem born before their mothers. Meanwhile, mums rarely get credit for moulding and building their kids in a kiln of cracked pavement slabs. There are less of them now, you think. Unripe teenagers, all baby hairs and too early baby bellies. Still, you remember the newspapers from your own teenage years. Large fonts and graphically close photos decrying these singular mothers, blaming them for the fact their children were being cut down like weeds. Why have we had no follow-ups, you think? Front pages used to scream teenage mums in record highs, but no one goes back to show the 29-year-olds you know feeding and clothing and preparing their own teens to go out into the world. Still, life turned out different for you. You might have read Keisha the Skit, but you didn't act on it. You might have met the man dem down the park, but never for too long. You kept your head down instead. Face first in books back then, knee deep in toil these days because every day is work day. Grinding because if you don't, who will? You work as hard as your mother does, overburdened and underhyped. Find it easier to cross between worlds than your brothers can, those dark boys who colonise stairwells and our states. Often, their voices aren't allowed to code switch across postcodes like yours is. Their voices could be wrought against silver, but they'd still fall on ears too beeswaxed to hear. Dark boys round here are seen as have, are heard as having dark voices everywhere. Yours, though. Your voice is tempered by your gender. You are allowed to have a posh voice and a road voice, and you are not sure which voice is actually yours. You have chipped away at your voice for so long you've forgotten what you actually sound like. There are many of you. Black girls the wrong side of a line made of brown paper bags, parents low incomes but hard way working, you new daughters of Africa with expectation tattooed across your backs. You made your way to centuries old universities in this new land, building so white your skin felt dirty, where elites comment, commented politely on the way you mispronounce hyperbole, epitome, segue, but also water, laughing, mother, you would drop your T's and G's, find a V where there is none, water, laughing, Mother, wrong, they would tell you, wrong. So you shaved your words into shape. You scrubbed your council flat from the flat of your tongue. You learned to move your mouth and hands less. You convinced yourself your accent was a mess. And so you point blank but banished blatantly and yeba and wallahi and na and ra and oh my days. <laughs> Years of being told you sounded white or stush or posh, but now, here, here you are road. Now you are, you are you, posh voiced, bouncing between dialects depending upon who you are speaking to. You talk to people and you want to cry sometimes because you cannot tell if this is what you actually are supposed to sound like, if this is your real voice. Now you've forgotten your first language. 
Not the one your parents speak or the pigeon hybrid that you understand more the more you listen to it, no. With every passing day, you lose the language of your only true home. The words wrought from cracked pavement slabs, those weighted words spoken by boys who colonize stairwells. Now you know how to speak properly. You'll get your hair done and you speak to your auntie who's not your auntie in an accent that mimics her own. You use the same strange voice that starts to appear somewhere down the pe town the high road, somewhere along your long walk to weave the strands that sprout from your scalp. Getting your hair done round here means navigating an obstacle course of women with babies strapped to their backs, women peering through shop windows on Peckham High Street and spilling from doorways. It means avoiding the too quick to see until it's too late grabs from taloned rows of French tip fingertip claws. It means ignoring the hissing much to catch your attention. S -s -s Sister, can I do your hair? Sometime along this walk, some te somewhere inside your no, I'm all right, I've got someone already, repeated response. Your voice changes. This weird accent appears. It's involuntary, subconscious, and it appears every time you start speaking to an African elder. You arrive at your auntie who's not your auntie's high-rise front door to get your hair done. The voice, this voice, your voice for today, is fully formed now, a voice wrought against the paving stones that surround this block. The lifts round here are always broken, so you climb seven stories up in the air, sweat pooling at the base of your silk scarf-covered neck with each step. You have always had to work hard to get your, to get your hair done, to make your hair work. One step, two step, leap to avoid a puddle of piss. Four step, five step, six step, manoeuvre around a group of boys who look to so many like men. The stairwell they have colonised smells like weed and opportunity because these boys are always hustling. You glance over them, younger than you, this murder of navy and back, black, a shoal of night track suits and side bags. These flightless birds, these fish still swimming out of water. You wonder how hard it must have been for them to grow here, to sprout from the cracks in the pavement stones. You breathe in, breathe out, breathe. Let the grimy Afrobeat trap drill rat beats that seep from their crack screens fill the bottom of your lungs. What does it mean that the music they are making now sounds like what you were raised on? or sounds like what their parents escaped from. Back home, drum beats versus artillery fire. You go to raves with your mates and are reminded of daddy limba ringing in your ears as your mother forced you to pass an uncle another bottle of super malt, petulance splayed across your face. You scour YouTube for music and hear gunshots. The music these boys play loudly and proudly from phones in the corners of stairwells is fresh off a boat that sailed straight from your diaspora childhood and you are in awe of it. Their music is London and Accra and Birmingham and Lagos and Leeds. Their music doesn't need anything more than what it is. Their music is settled in its chaos. You know that they are as you are. Desperate to, ne desperate to connect with parents and parents' parents and parents' parents' parents. You and they are desperate to have a home somewhere, but that is maybe impossible. And so you at least want to say that you sound like you found one. You'll get your hair done. Walking past boys who have colonised concrete they had no right to but did anyway, you ascend this home, a home, a home of sorts perhaps, okay, you didn't even grow up here but you did because it's another estate in these ends and that's okay, eight step, nine step, land on the tenth, seven, seven stories up in the air, fist poised to knock through a wrought iron gap. You assess the ways you have changed since the early days of coming to this home to get your hair braided. You are older now, your head is lighter now, less weighted with expectation and two full braids. Still, sometimes you look so heavy, it happens more the older you get, your friends are all the same. You wear a lot of jewellery because it's nice to be reminded there is something else that weighs you down. You keep your too long acrylics on because being physically unable to do every single task you're asked to calms your anxiety. You took the earrings and nails off at uni. Sent them away alongside your jewellery and a voice you once had that you're not sure is still yours. But now, your jewellery and acrylic and voice box have returned. As have you. Here today, here tomorrow, and the next, and the next. Now you have accepted you are part of this place. Now you have accepted you are part of this. Now you have accepted you are. Now you are. You are. You. 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 Thank you.